Welcome to Hip Hop Movie Club, where three old heads put their old heads together to vibe on some of the most memorable or forgettable hip hop themed movies of all time. And here's HHMC with your HHMCs, Boogie, JB, uh, yeah. and Dino Wright. Season 5, Episode 1, Straight Outta Compton. <laughs> Written by Jonathan Herman and Andrea Burloff. Directed by F. Gary Gray. Produced by Ice Cube, Tomiko Woods Wright, Dr. Dre, Matt Alvarez, F. Gary Gray, and Scott Bernstein. Released in 2015 and featuring O'Shea Jackson Jr., Corey Hawkins, Jason Mitchell, and Paul Giamatti. We'll answer the question, what happens when these boys from the hood skyrocket out of Compton? Straight Outta Compton is a 2015 biographical drama depicting the rise and fall of the hip-hop group N.W.A. and its members Easy e Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, MC Ren, and DJ Yella, some of whom would go on to become American icons. Boogie, you want to kick us off with the major themes that you saw throughout Triana Compton and how you feel about it? Absolutely. This is a super realistic and accurate depiction of the forming of NWA and the subsequent success that followed the release of their self-titled debut album. It also chronicles the rise and fall of the group and the subsequent breakup. I think the actors that portray Eazy-E, Dr. Dre, and Ice Cube, coincidentally, his son, O'Shea Jackson Jr., was spot on, man. They were they were so accurate. Like If I, if I didn't know what the actual artists look like I would swear that I was watching them in this in this film. I was not as familiar with Jerry Heller in real life, other than you know what I've heard from him in interviews. But Paul Giamatti is a great actor, and he was excellent in that role. So I mean, it was it was so entertaining from beginning to end. Like beforehand, we were talking, and we knew some of you know the background grievances that occurred within the group, but. This kind of brought it all to light and and, and put it on the on the film, so you can kind of see what happened. Yeah, it was it was very entertaining. I, I've watched it several times, and every time I watched it, I've enjoyed it. It's it's very well done, you know. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It was an awesome depiction of these players. We grew up listening to these guys. I was not as big into the West Coast scene, but obviously some of these great hits I've known, like Express Yourself and and many others. And, and when NWA, they burst on the scene and they were unstoppable force. Um, and now people today, they know Dr. Dre from a lot of his business ventures, Beats by Dre and Ice Cube from the movies um, and a lot of things he's gone on to. Paul Giamatti was awesome, like you said, in the role of Jerry Heller. O'Shea Jackson Jr., who's a megastar now, just like his father. I love that it it gives you, like, the whole story from their upbringing up until their rise and their demise, I guess, or the breakup. Not so much of a demise, but the demise of the group itself. Compton is just a brutal place to grow up. You saw the ridiculous profiling that they had to endure, police brutality they faced just by the way they dressed uh, with no just cause. They were constantly harassed by the police. There was a one scene that was really jaw dropping when this guy, I think his name was OG Two-Tone. He came on the school bus, pointed a gun at the kids on the school bus because they were like razzing them through the window. These are gang gang members so you can tell this was not no uh not any ordinary like rainbow and lollipop type childhood that these these guys grew up with yeah so you would think like how would they ever come out come out with a song like f the police which was extremely controversial obviously and we'll get to that a little bit later but you can see i mean this was ingrained in them that police who you should look up to to serve and protect and they had negative connotation because they were constantly being profiled. They were wearing, you know, as they grew up into a rap group, 
and they took on the colors of like black and silver. They wore a lot of like Raiders outfits or even LA Kings and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But just because of the way they looked, the cops would come out and tackle them, shackle them up. And there's like, what are we, what are we being cuffed for or whatever? And like, don't worry about it, you know? And then they would like, let them go. So it was rough. Yeah. yeah very dehumanizing to have to deal with it on a, on a constant basis. And you can see why having to deal with that, you know, for years and years and years, it kind of ingrains in your head that, yeah, we don't need to deal with them and kind of middle finger to them pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As the group forms, you have uh, Ice Cube. And it's funny, you see him writing lyrics on the school bus. So even as a child, he had that masterful skill of writing lyrics. And you see Dr. Dre was an amazing DJ. but And his mom was stern. I, I saw there was an early scene where she slapped him for being lazy with a job interview. So he had that <laughs> focus. And that came from his mother. Yeah. And Easy E... Uh, Eric Wright was deemed the Barry Gordy of the operation. He kind of was a producer. So he kind of, kind of knew a little bit of the business aspect of it. And he's the one that would eventually hook up with uh, Jerry Heller. I think Easy es ultimate demise was he was a lot more into the partying and, you know, all the women and all the spoils that come with the success. But you could see that Dr. Dre and Ice Cube kind of had that bigger picture mentality and, you know, that would go on to prove true later on. Right. Easy e had the focus on the business side that Dr. Dre and Ice Cube had. They they were probably never broken up. <laughs> yeah. They would have been able to, you know, he would have reviewed the contracts. He would have seen where Jerry was, was coming from from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, Dre kind of convinced Easy e to put some money into the operation, also to rap. They're like, all right, we have these beats and you know, we kind of have ideas. We have these lyrics, but like, what? How do we get to that next level? And I think Easy E had money already. And it, again, so these, even though you know these guys are profiled, they're no angels, right? You know, they're they're involved in the drug scene and guns and whatnot. But uh, so Easy E probably had some money from from that background. The first rehearsal with Easy E rapping was really funny. That was a funny scene. <laughs> he was so bad. He was so bad. It's classic. <laughs> yeah. Oh man! Yeah, but Dre had that. Di- Dre had that direction, saying, "Listen, you got to believe what you're saying. Got to believe in it. See how you just yelled back at me? He was like, now put that into your lyrics, and he he did. You would think that someone talented like him." didn't need that much coaching but it seems like he did <laughs> right yeah he did i guess everyone's got to start somewhere and that's where he started <laughs> yeah but he took it and ran with it because <laughs> you would have never guessed from the way he was you know that he needed coaching in the beginning <laughs> yeah never would have guessed it <laughs> they were very innovative in that their lyrics were about their upbringing. And again, they're talking about the hardcore life they're living and the oppression from the police and all this stuff. And if you recall, Lonzo, the club owner, dismissed them. He dismissed rap music and was saying he wanted slow jams. He's like, there's no, nobody wants to hear about low riders and guns and gangster stuff. And boy, was he wrong. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, so these guys make it. Maybe. He didn't reckon with middle America, like teenage oh, suburban kids like us that, <laughs> that 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 bought into it, like right, wanted to hear it. Yeah, this gave these guys a voice, right? This was an artistic outlet for them. And I look how many people these days have made money off of careers off of the same type of lyrics, the braggadocio gangster and all that stuff and obviously it it took the american government aback i mean especially when um you know again when they come out with f the police and they were threatened so you can't say that this is going to incite violence and i can see both sides of it um but again it's you know then you have the free speech argument as well where do you cross that line right that's a huge debate and still to this day yeah it absolutely is well, let's talk a little bit about like Easy E meeting Jerry Heller. It looked like it was like at a warehouse or factory. And he was Jerry Heller, played by Paul Giamatti, was he had a 
great track record or a great resume, I should say. He had worked with Journey, Elton John, Otis Redding, Creedence Clearwater Revival, some huge names in the industry. And Jerry said, I'll make you legit. You know, you guys have a lot of talent and I'll make you legit. And then he was also affiliated with Priority Records, the guy, Brian Turner. And the thing that cracked me up to, <laughs> Brian Turner said, I, who, I represent the California Raisins. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Listeners don't remember the California Raisins. <laughs> Put it in the show notes, but you really should just Google them. The California Raisins. Yeah, briefly cartoonish raisins if you can imagine that would sing and dance and they did i heard it through the grapevine yeah. um, they were claymation right claymation. Claymation. kind of claymation yeah right yes. right but they that was a big thing i think they ended up having maybe an animated show or something and then mm -hmm. a lot of merchandise with the california raisins yep so i think these guys were like all right seriously but and then brian turner was like I thought it was funny too until the checks started cashing and uh, <laughs> here we are. So you guys want to sign with us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Donna, right. Did you, did you catch too? There was a Mr. Furley and Mr. Drummond joke, like in the same sentence. Did you yes. catch that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. I was, I love that. Those are like two of my all time favorite shows between <laughs> different strokes and uh, three's company. Yes. Really? <laughs> Your soup furly. <laughs> yeah, they were joking. I think about about Jerry Heller just being like the older white guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. So there, there are some some little humorous aspects in there as well. But yeah, I think the, the uh, one of the parts that that struck out for me was when they were actually starting to record. And they were at the studio and they went outside to take a break. And as they're outside taking a break, the police rolled up on them and started harassing them for no reason. Meanwhile, here they are, they're, they're legitimately working. And even, you know, Jerry came outside and saw what was going on. He immediately became upset. And as he's trying to defend them, he couldn't even, he could barely, you know, control, control and contain the situation. But, but he got to see firsthand, like, Hey, this, you know, Whatever they're saying in their lyrics about the police, now you see why we are the way we are, uh, because this is what we have to deal with. Yeah, Ice Cube immediately, you know, went with that pen, put down probably one of their most famous and most well, most famous and infamous <laughs> songs. You know, F the police, pretty much telling them what they were all about and how they felt about the police, which you know subsequently got the attention of the FBI of all of all organizations and they were threatened with you know not you know being allowed to perform they were labeled as the world's most dangerous rap group <laughs> um they were pariah of, of America <laughs> you know but meanwhile you know the average person wanted you know average teenager wanted to hear what they had to say so their concerts were selling out their shows were selling out and I remember they were in Detroit yeah. And they were immediately pulled in beforehand and told that they were not to perform the song. And in typical NWA fashion, they performed the song. And right in the middle of performing this song, here comes the police. <laughs> Breaking it up. You know, I thought that, that was, was a one, wild that scene. Was one of my favorite yeah, that whole scenes. scene was yeah. very wild. And they almost it seemed like they were about to get away for a second, but Nope. In anticipation of them, you know, going to perform, the police already had a had a plan in action, so they were actually caught um, and arrested. Yeah, that's the type of stuff that they had to deal with, you know. I mean, of course, they weren't really going to go out and you know do anything to the police, but you know, they were rap is a, you know is an expression of it's a story of what you've been through, your life's situations, and they were just depicting what they've dealt with. And uh, but yeah. They got arrested for it. <laughs> yeah, that, that scene you mentioned, Boogie, with them just rehearsing and then the, the cops approach, one thing that really raised their ire was there was the black cop and he yeah. said, you heard what your master said. And I was like, wow, you want to, you have a black cop who is like invoking slavery. And I'm like, wow, that was really, that really yeah. cut deep. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there was, even before the Detroit concert, there was a concert in Cincinnati where the police kind of intimidated them, saying that they were inciting violence, and they kind of just, oh, like, all right, all right, and they brushed it off. But the Detroit concert was the one where they kind of, the FBI had like a cease and desist letter saying you cannot do it, and they they <laughs> they just took that and ran with it. And you see Jerry there and stuff like that. And then gunshots rained out, and everybody scatters. They ran and they kind of run out of the building into the arms of police. And they were like detained in, in the truck, but people were shouting after the police, after the police, it was kind of like a riotous scene. Yeah. And then there was like a press conference afterwards and I know ice cube was interviewed and they were saying, Oh, you know, do you feel that like you guys like incited the riot? How do you feel about inciting the riot? And he's like, seriously, we incited the riot. You see what we, we didn't really provoke them. Right. Been through exactly how they're treated. This is one of those classic Streisand effect kind of things where you try to tamp it down, it just gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> you can't yeah. control it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of the songs that they had at that con- the concerts, like Dope Man, the Dope Man song was great. And that, that was awesome. In this whole process, there's a scene where unfortunately Dre gets the news that his little brother Tyree had died. Um, he was close with him and he had um, Dre had told him that he was going to bring him out out there with him and take him on tour. And he kind of blamed himself for not having him you yeah. know, under his wing at that time, like close, close to his vest. So that, that was just another negative that Dr. Dre had to go through. And the other guys rallied around them saying, listen, we'll always be, always be brothers. We'll always be brothers. And that kind of comes to light later on when you see the rift that these guys have. It's like, Remember, we we're always supposed to be brothers, but you see, unfortunately, jealousy starts to rear its ugly head here. You start to see little cracks in their, their loyalty because you see, I think there was one scene where Dre and Cube were like, Ice Cube, he sees Jerry and Easy kind of like whispering or being really too close they were eating eating lobster and and i think you yeah. may mention the dre's like man we're eating fat burger and these guys are eating lobster <laughs> right yeah that seem right <laughs> yep so hey, what's up with that <laughs> yeah what's up with that um and then jerry you know i think cube did approach jerry at one time and jerry was asking are you so you, are you eager to sign with ruthless records because q was like saying where where's my contract like what am i getting paid and it was and like that so jerry kept kind of blowing him off like oh yeah it's in the works it's in the works but then he said are, are you eager to join ruthless records and he said i'll also give you a check for like 75k as a sweetener and q wasn't having it he said i want, I want a lawyer to review it yeah yeah and that's when it's kind of revealed to him that it's eric's company and i think that took ice cube back, uh, back a little bit. It's like Eric's company. I thought we kind of worked for you. And, and Jerry was like, no, I, I worked for him, you know? So, yeah. yeah, but Dre, Dr. Dre had signed his deal, but cube had told him, you know, I don't think you should have done that. Yes. There's a big, big rift here. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that rift once, uh, once it started, it was, whew, <laughs> it got ugly quick. <laughs> it did. Really ugly, yep. Man, I remember watching that rift in in real time and saying, "What happened?" <laughs> they were throwing diss tracks back and forth across. The, it was like they were standing across the street, just flinging diss tracks at one another. <laughs> yeah, like, what's what is going on? <laughs> what are you guys doing? <laughs> yes, so Cube had been making the music with these, you know, with MWA, and he he told Priority Records that he's leaving the company to go solo. And he destroyed that Brian Turner's office with a bat. He just took a baseball bat to the the gold records of platinum, whatever. He was just smashing things because he he never really saw the the fruits of his labor. Whereas Easy was obviously getting paid, and so he left. Easy, he was not happy about that. And then Cube goes out on his own and has a huge success, you know. And also, so Easy, he's jealous of Cube shooting up the uh, billboard charts and then the disc, like you said, the disc tracks ensue. Although the first disc track was NWA against Ice Cube when he was on his own. And then Cube came back with that no Vaseline track on his solo album. Yeah. That was rough. (laughs) (laughs) That no Vaseline. That that's one of the greatest 
diss records of all time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, they show like Jerry and Easy E, and I think it's Ren and Yellow listening to that. Yeah. And they're like, what? And then um they were all getting angry, and Jerry was pissed because there was uh anti-Semitism in there as well. And he's just like, This is not right, this is not right. I can't you know deal with that. And then they kind of see each other at some event and a big brawl ensue- ensues as well. And speaking of brawls and violence, the shadowy figure that we all know as Suge Knight is introduced as well. Yeah. Which is sort of, he was a positive for at least Cube and Dre. He was supporting them trying to get to the bottom of the contracts. I suppose everyone has an ulterior motive and it's just a... Yeah, get in good with them, with the expense of Jerry and Easy. Yeah, Sh- Suge Knight. For those that may not know, is this big hulking and t- the biggest, most intimidating figure out there. And there's theories that he is involved with both the murders of Tupac and Biggie. If you look it up, you guys can look it up. The theories. I'm not going to insinuate anything, but I mean, he was with Tupac the night he got shot, but. At the pool party, Suge Knight eyes up Jerry. There was a big pool party they were having. Suge Knight is just a nasty man. He, he uh, There was one scene where he just assaulted a man for taking his parking spot. Yeah. And as as you mentioned, Donna Wright, Dre and Cube wanted to be released from Ruthless Records. And Suge and his crew, his henchmen, they beat Easy e up to a pulp to try to ensure that he gets released from the, the, the Ruthless Records. Easy E wants to retaliate. He literally wants to kill Suge Knight and Jerry calms him down. I saw something later on uh, when I was doing some more research for this episode that Jerry said that he re- he actually regrets talking him <laughs> out of trying to kill Suge Knight. He's like, if you would have killed him, a lot of people would have been better off. I was like, wow. That's kind wow. of crazy. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a heck of a butterfly effect right there. Yeah. <laughs> right. You think of all of the theories, yep, that, that that have his name in the twine. Like I've even heard a story of how he um, hung Vanilla Ice. Yes, out of yeah, a hotel that's a balcony. classic story. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's all kind of like any 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 like behind the scenes, you know, TV show that documents, you know, rappers or you know. There's always a a, a night like a ninety percent chance that Suge Knight is going to pop up in the middle of the documentary, <laughs> and something weird is going to happen. But um, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, there was a story. So Suge Knight apparently, uh, Vanilla Ice, aka Rob Van Winkle, was accused by Suge Knight of I don't know using some of his music or something like that. <laughs> so it wasn't only Queen and David Bowie that he ripped. <laughs> So apparently, apparently, Suge Knight had 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 somebody in his crew that I guess may, maybe owned some of the rights to some of the music. So he intimidated the heck out of uh, Vanilla Ice, and I think the proceeds from either Ice Ice Baby or the album, I'm not sure, were going to go to him. Um, they said he hung out, the, hung him, hung him by his feet out a window, but apparently Vanilla Ice said that he threatened him, but he didn't necessarily do that but either way you don't want to be on suge knight's bad side <laughs> seriously he's currently still incarcerated um i think it was a hit and run mm-hmm. most recently but he was he had a lot of charges over the years aggravated assault and uh, other other charges and whatnot suge knight actually uh i had looked him up he played in the NFL for a brief yeah. period he was a football he, player yeah. yeah he crossed the picket lines in 1987 and played on I think it was the, for the Rams, the strike year. He played on it for college at UNLV for a few years in the mid in the mid eighties. Yeah, so he was a big dude. <laughs> yeah, so there's diss tracks going back and forth. And unfortunately, you see Easy E's health deteriorating. You see him a lot of coughing a lot towards the end. And we all knew what had happened with Easy E, you know, in real life that he uh, had been diagnosed with HIV. I didn't realize how quickly his demise was unfortunately because when he he had fainted while they were he was like recording or you know practicing the studio the sad part of it is easy e and ice cube were talking of 
reuniting the whole group, NWA. Yeah. And Ice Cube said, I, I, I know we diss back and forth, but man, we, we could do this. You know, we can let bygones be bygones. I would do it if Dre was, if Dre's down with it and Dre was down with it. But unfortunately, like as, you know, Easy E's trying to practice and get things set up again, he fainted, take him right in the hospital and he's diagnosed with HIV and his T cell count was ridiculously low, like 14 or something like that, or it should be in the hundreds. Yeah. So he was given like six months to live. That was sad. If I felt really, uh, yeah, really bad about that. Yeah, that was that was very sad to. I mean, even knowing what happened, it was sad to see it. <laughs> you know, as he's going through the health crisis, that's when he. I don't know if it was a wife or a girlfriend. They she kind of like brought to light that Jerry Heller was was actually taking advantage of him. They're going through a lot of the finances. It's like this check bounced. This one never came through, and. He uh, easy. He does confront Jerry, and says you were you know taking advantage of them. And they each kind of claim that they both screwed things up. It was sad, but you know Dre and Q both come to visit him in the hospital, and you know Dre, Dre was saying how he loved him. And Ren and Yellow gave him a Bone Thugs tape in the hospital because he was part of their record label. Yeah, yeah, he helped launch their career. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, sad thing is that, you know, and then Dre leaves Death Row Records. You know, he uh, he confronts Suge Knight and said, listen, I need to get out from under your thumb. And that's always a dangerous proposition there. But he did it. And his, and uh, I thought it was silly. It was kind of like, oh, what are you going to call it? He's like, aftermath. <laughs> I thought that was silly, too. It yeah. seemed like oh, a little too much poetic license. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like really, did that really not go down like that? Yeah, like like Suge Knight doesn't strike me as someone that's like, hey, by the way, what you know, what are you gonna call your record? Like, Suge Knight don't care about that. He's just pissed yeah. that he's leaving him. Seriously, yeah. that is one of the things I didn't like. <laughs> yeah, that's too exactly that's one of the things I didn't like as well. But uh, yeah, I mean this this was just really well done. Yeah, highly entertaining, but yeah, it was really yeah. well done. And I watched the director's cut, which was 20 minutes longer. And so I can put in, in the show notes a website that had a, a breakdown of all the different scenes and things. But even so, I thought there were a couple of things that didn't really need to be in it. But one thing that was in it, in the director's cut, which I don't think was in the, the theatrical cut, was when they go on tour, Easy e has a bag of guns and artillery he shows jerry in the beginning before they get on the bus <laughs> that wow. was kind of it's like oh that's how we're rolling okay because <laughs> in the in the hotel you, you see them they have a bunch of guns already and so right. yeah that was one of the things he added to this jeff gary gray to flesh out the story a little more and uh but the aftermath part was something it's like really you kept that in <laughs> yeah you reminded me, Donna Wright. Um, you reminded me too. You're probably thinking exactly what I'm thinking. Are you going to say it? No, no, go ahead. I was going to say the bye Felicia. Bye Felicia. Scene. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was great that they put that in there. So bye Felicia, which we mentioned on the Friday episode, which has become just an uber popular meme and expression to dismiss someone. They had it in their 1989 <laughs> tour with NWA. How you know these guys were rock stars, mega stars. So they were having all types of women up in the rooms and whatnot. And uh, you could get some guy knocking on the door saying, "Is my is my girl in there? My girl in there?" And 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 what's her name? Felicia. <laughs> so they're asking around, asking around. <laughs> you know, she's with someone uh, in a compromising position, so to speak. And uh, they go back to her, and then. Eventually, she's booted out of the hotel room, and it was the by Felicia. So <laughs> I don't know if that was again artistic license, creative license, but hey, they they yeah, it's in there. So that was a that kind was of very entertaining. Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> oh man, wow, wow. that was yeah <laughs> gives new meaning because I actually watched Friday before I've seen this, and now it's like oh, that gives a whole new meaning to by Felicia. Really kind of uh, denigrating, yeah like to have seen more about ice cube going solo because i feel like that was the breaking of the dam and i felt like he was in nwa and all of a sudden he wasn't and i thought i thought there'd be more exposition of that but 
Okay. Even though I thought it was a really entertaining and I really enjoyed it, uh, I thought, oh, it felt kind of jarring. Like, oh, he's already he's already going solo. Like, I mean, at the time, I couldn't remember exactly how it went. This is thirty years ago. <laughs> right. Forty? No, thirty years ago. Yeah, in the, in the film, it, it seems it seems to happen pretty quickly. Yeah, so it's kind of hard to, to to gauge the timeline, you know, in my head of how it how long it took for for him to go solo. But yeah, in the film it happens really quick. <laughs> Say, oh, he's not with the group anymore. <laughs> oh, oh, there's a diss track. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's like, another diss track. <laughs> I mean, oh, they're guess... fighting. <laughs> <laughs> I know they try to bring it out in the in the contract stuff, but even the decision to go solo, I thought, I think would have seen that. But well, what am I? They, they introduced uh, Tupac and Snoop Dogg in this as well. They come into the studio, they meet the guys and stuff like that. Also, I mean, I remember just from being a hip hop fan, like I remember Snoop doing some diss tracks as well against easy e some saying some really nasty things oh, yeah. like that so i don't know if that falls within this time frame i would think it would be yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, before easy e passed away but yeah, it's on a chronic album yeah so it's kind of like that wasn't really mentioned there like things got really really nasty and they, they kind of hit on it but i i guess they left a little bit of that out as well yeah, yeah. i was in that um f with f with dre day um, yes yes yeah, bow wow wow. Yippee, yippee, yippee. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, everybody was yeah, they would that that whole video was crazy. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, they had someone portraying I remember now they're portraying Easy E. Uh -huh. and, and, yeah, oh uh, yeah. He's he's and again in compromising positions and stuff yes. like that. They really, they really compromising <laughs> positions and you know, you know, with the sign out dancing for tap dancing and trying to get money and stuff. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, they really ripped him. Yeah. Another character they did that that they introduced to was one of my who, who at the time would have been one of my favorite voices in hip hop was the DOC. Yes, they did kind of mention what happened to him because he he was on a rise as well, and then he had a car accident on um, which resulted in his larynx getting crushed and him losing his voice. So he lost. He he wasn't able to continue with his career at that time but yeah that was that was cool like they kind of cool that they kind of threw him in there as well because he was he was kind of under the umbrella the nwa umbrella as well but he wasn't a he wasn't a member of the group but he was a, a close affiliate and was kind of latching on to their success and was about to make his his ascent as well sad that that happened to him though yeah, DOC was from Dallas, from and I remember Dallas, he, he yeah. came in to the West yeah. Coast to be with these guys and kind of help, you know, foster their their careers and stuff like that. Yeah, and I remember DOC. Yeah, they had. I mean, get, getting funky is still one of my yeah, favorite. That first track. album was yeah. crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that beat, goodness. getting funky. I gotta, I gotta yes. listen to that one after this. <laughs> yeah. Funky, the formula. Yeah. The Diggy Diggy Doctor, yeah. yes. Oh man, <laughs> he had some bangers. Yeah, for sure, he had some bangers. Yeah. I remember at the time trying to figure out like what happened to him. Like I didn't know. Yeah, I remember years later finding out why he stopped putting out music. I said, like, "Oh wow, that's that's crazy." And then you know when I saw it happen in the movie, I was like, "Wow, yeah, they, they depicted it in the movie. Wow." And um, sadly, Easy E was only thirty-one years old when he died. Yeah, and so just, young, so, so young, so young, so young. And I kind of felt bad for him. Like I said, he got. I mean, so being an outsider, you know, just again a fan of hip hop, I I saw the way that Easy E was just uh, humiliated through these diss tracks and the music videos and stuff like that but he was he was really i guess the founding father of nwa he 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 was i guess the, the brains behind the operations and the thing is you know he's responsible for hooking up with jerry but if, if they didn't have jerry heller maybe they wouldn't have you know got to that level of course yeah. there's issues and whatnot but they kind of held it against them i don't think he i just think he was taking advantage but i don't think he had that really big picture mentality like i said or the business sense so he's like right. all right listen i got someone here he's 
he's got great experience. He has a great track record. I'm signing with him. Let's do it. And there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that I don't think anybody really knows. Even after seeing this, we really don't know the full story. Like how mm. much did Cuban Dre get ripped off? Like did Jerry rip off? All those other bands, you know, over the years, I don't know. Like, and right. I tried to research. I don't know. Was he taking right. advantage of these young urban guys because he thought he could? I don't know. It, it it does say that it does portray him as being a swindler and, you know, not giving them what they deserve. But like, I really, that's one of the things too, is like, I, I wish I'd know more details about how badly these guys were exploited. Right. Yeah. And, and um, degrees of being rich, <laughs> yeah, they got famous, but how rich could they should they have been, <laughs> right? Right, <laughs> well, I like that they have the epilogue a little bit of an epilogue where you know, obviously, Dre is credited with helping launching the careers of multiple people like Eminem and 50 Cent, you know, like under this Interscope label, and, and obviously, Beats Electronics, which. Beats by Dre was sold to Apple in 2014 for three billion dollars. <laughs> so billion you know, Dre did all right. Cube <laughs> is a megastar. He's been in so many films, and and his son O'Shea Jackson Jr. has been in multiple films, the Star Wars franchise with Mandalorian and everything. Yeah. These guys are ultra rich now, but they had to go through a lot. Yeah. yeah. Hump from humble beginnings. Yep. I did have one gripe. It was inconsistent too, but you know, we grew up in the time where starter hats were a big deal, and uh, some of them were not period accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, keen eye. I was like, uh... I'm a graphic designer, and so I noticed these things. Like that's the wrong typeface. That that font's wrong, and wow. most of the time the font was wrong in those Raiders and and Kings hats because I used to own some of those hats. Mm-hmm. And it, but when they did have it right, I thought, oh, what happened there? I guess uh, maybe they couldn't license them or something from from Starter or whoever else owns the the trademarks. But mm, mm. everything else was super accurate except for the hats. <laughs> 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 oh, well, what are you going to do? Well, no, I wouldn't have picked up on that. That's, that's a keen observation. Yeah, I totally didn't catch catch that. I didn't catch it at all. Yeah, these no, brush like... script when, the, when it was a, a different uh, like custom font, but uh, I'm like, oh, oh well. <laughs> One of the tidbit I, f- I found out, like I said, I didn't know much about Jerry Heller, um, but like I said, he had a long history of success with a lot of bands, but he didn't like the way he was portrayed in this movie so he filed a lawsuit i believe hmm. and I, I guess it, i don't know if it was against f gary gray or not but he thought that it was either libel or slanderous or whatever the way he was portrayed a little bit he actually had a heart attack while driving a year or two after this film and he was in his early 70s i think oh wow oh and the irony for me in this too is I'm a huge sports fanatic and I don't know if you guys real put two and two together, but you know, Paul Giamatti's the son of a Bartlett Giamatti, the former oh, I, I, commissioner. I'm worried about that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's some odd parallel here is that Bart Giamatti was a commissioner, I want to say sometime in the 90s. Yeah. He's the one that put the ban on Pete Rose mm-hmm. to say he could never get into the Hall of Fame because of his gambling history and stuff like that. And he got a lot of backlash from that. Now, that stress from that, plus that he was a heavy smoker, he had a massive heart attack several uh, several months after he made that declaration. And then Faye Vincent took over mm-hmm. as baseball commissioner. So it was odd to me that he had that massive heart attack due to stress. And I think it was like 51 years old. And then um, the character played by Paul Giamatti mm-hmm. had a massive heart attack due to stress from the way he's portrayed there. So it was kind of interesting to me. I did not know that. Yeah, I just oh. read something that Bart Giamatti wrote too about baseball. Oh, yeah. Very intelligent family. I know Paul went to Yale 
Paul Giamatti went to Yale. He's been in a ton of things. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely a great. He's, he's a well accomplished actor. Yeah. You know, he's only in his like early to mid 50s, but his portrayal of Jerry Heller, which was done in 2015, he looks like he's like in six, like he played a much older character and he pulled it off really well. He's a great actor. He's very versatile. Yeah. He's in a lot of things. Uh, he, you know, he has a whole filmography, but. I think he was in Fred Claus. I was just was flipping through. <laughs> Fred Claus. <laughs> He's in a lot of commercials and stuff. He was in, I don't know, it was Billions or something? Like some one of these series. Uh, he's, he's in a ton of things, but he's always excellent. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. Oh, man, I can't think of the show that he was in. The Colonial Period. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. He was good in that. <laughs> he was really good in it. But, um, yeah, he's a great actor. Yeah, so did you enjoy the music? That's kind of a no-brainer here. I mean, you got a lot of the NWA stuff, which was outstanding. Yeah, I was an unofficial member of the group. Couldn't tell me anything. <laughs> I had my Raiders, my Raiders hat, my Kings hat, my so- my White Sox hat. <laughs> and my black my black Lee jeans <laughs> I did appreciate I I that a... they, they had a little Craig Mack in this in this movie too so, ooh, yeah. Get, yeah. That, get that estate a little uh, royalties and such <laughs> obviously they played straight out of Compton the dope man I forget how good some of those songs were and yeah. so yeah. Har- harmonic <clears throat> It made the the concert scenes really good. That yeah. Like, oh man, that's right. This song's awesome. Yeah, that one that one scene where they did the that um we want easy scene. Yeah. That yeah. was spot on because that was the video, the music video was just like that. I was watching like that looks just like the music video. Wow, they they really mm-hmm. pulled that off. Wow, it's like you was watching a music video but from a different angle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, you see the scene towards the end where Dr. Dre is coming up like the melody for nothing but a G thing, like he's sampling. Yes. Yeah. He has like and even though the um the scene where Cube is working on a script for Friday. Yeah. Yes. On a compact <laughs> laptop. <laughs> yeah. I thought, oh man. <laughs> what do they have to do to get that laptop working again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, <he's>... CGI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, easy. He had jokes about that. He was he called it an after school special, and then Q was like, "Really? That's an after school special?" He's like, "Ah, oh, no, nah, I'm just kidding." That's when they were like reconciling a little bit. Yeah. So the, the the soundtrack's great. Most a lot of NWA. There's some Ice Cube solo stuff on there. Parliament's on there. Funkadelic. Um, Ooh, yeah. Man. So good, so good. So that after watching the movie, uh, there were more p- Parliament and Funkadelic songs in my head, more so than the NWA songs that were in my <laughs> head. Like, <laughs> that's, oh man! I mean, they they know what they were doing, sampling George Clinton stuff. Oh, absolutely! Really <laughs> so good, timeless, timeless, mm-hmm. timeless samples. Yes, yes. <laughs> But, um, Normally would ask, like, could this be made today? But I don't know if that's applicable because this is the biopic. You know, this is. Yeah. I don't think it's applicable to this. Yeah. And it was just released a few years ago. Yeah. 2015. Not, not necessary. Ah, yeah. uh, speaking of which. Can I tell my little story about how I. Yes. I meant to ask. Yes. I hear the story. <laughs> okay. Story time. We're going to get a little segue real quick. So. For the, for the listeners out there, I attended the the Hot 97 screening for Straight Outta Compton. And the way that that came about was I was driving home from work one evening, uh, listening to the Hot 97 sister station, which is WBLS on uh, 107.5, um, run, hosted by Deja Vu, who was the on-air DJ personality. And she announced that Caller 107 would win tickets to 
the screening of Straight Outta Compton. So I was driving in my car and I just fiddled around with the phone and got her on speakerphone and I actually won. And they actually played me on air, you know, talking to her and she announcing to me that I won the tickets. So they told me that I would need to pick up the tickets at the Hot 97 studio a few days later. So on August 12th, 2015, I got my younger sister, Nikki, and we jumped in my car. We drove over to New York to the Hot 97 studio, picked up the tickets there, which was pretty quick and easy. And from there, we headed uptown to Harlem for the movie screening. Uh, once we got there, there was a DJ there from Hot 97. He was playing some music for the background. Well, actually, it wasn't background music. He was playing pretty loud. Like It was almost like a party going on. Where is this at? Is that the Apollo? No, it wasn't at the Apollo. It was at the... Um, but it was around the corner from the Apollo. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll come back when I can remember the name. <laughs> but there was uh, they were asking trivia questions and they were handing out prizes to people who got the correct you know the answers correct. The Ebro in the morning radio crew was there. Who I listened to uh, on in the mornings on my way to work. And coincidentally, um, Laura Styles, who is in the Ebro in the morning show with Hot ninety seven, her and her entourage sit directly behind me in the road directly behind me and as she's sitting down or she's talking talking to one of her her uh, her girls she bumped me in the back of the head <laughs> so <laughs> it was kind of funny because i'm like what the and she turned around to apologize and i'm just like hey she's like, i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i'm so sorry so me in typical boogie fashion I say you know that's all right no problem don't worry about it all it's going to cost you is a selfie <laughs> so what does she does she said all right get out your phone so i pull out my phone and i take a picture she like leans over we take a selfie together i'm like oh this is pretty cool but she was really 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 nice person so we, we watched the movie and then on the way out spotted another person who i recognize dj enough who's one of the heavy hitters for New York, and he also DJs for Hot 97 as well as WBLS. And I got a picture with him. He was real cool and everything. And I, I talked to him for a few minutes. Another DJ who just started a few days prior, um, Megan Wright was there, but I did not realize it was her until I got home. Um, so I saw her and I didn't realize who she was. I just thought, you know, maybe she was just somebody that worked, with, you know, Hot 97 exec or something like that because she was with him the whole time and everything. But when I got home and saw who she was, I was so mad because <laughs> not only is she a really nice DJ, like she's really good and she's um, got some production songs under, but she's attractive. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh man, I could have had a picture with her. Mr. Ch your chance. <laughs> Mr. <Mister> chance. <laughs> but um, yeah, when I got home, I posted all of my pictures up from the, from the day I tagged um, Laura Styles who actually um, went to my picture and she liked my picture. So there you yeah. go. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> yeah, but it was cool, though. It was a really cool experience. My sister Nikki and I, we talk about it all the time. So every time, you know, the topic of or of Straight Outta Compton pops up, it kind of takes me back to 2015 and um, my whole experience with that. I just wanted to share that. That's um, so cool. With, you know, with the listeners that I was able to, experienced that firsthand that's a great memory yeah. you should put those pictures up in the instagram stories or tiktok <laughs> yeah I, I definitely i still have the pictures there i can definitely share them yeah, we'll share them out <laughs> if theaters in harlem i see are the best 10 or the amc magic johnson i think it was the we say again was the first one the best 10 no it wasn't the best 10 wait, wait where's the best 10 one at 2310 broadway no, it wasn't that one. Hmm. Maybe it was the Magic Johnson one. Yeah, but it was it was it was really nice. It was a really nice theater, like a super. It was like a super multiplex. Nice, very cool. It was the Magic Johnson. Magic one. Johnson, yeah. Yep, Frederick Douglass. Yeah, the one on Frederick Douglass. Okay, yep, that's it. Nice. I'll say. Speak. Speaking of New York, I want to give a quick shout out to Gianna P. Uh, she is was advertising a hip hop movie club uh, out in Times Square recently, putting a sticker out there. So nice. Oh, nice. Thanks. Thanks, Gianna P. We're making it big time because of you. <laughs> three, 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 three.
All right. So I think this is kind of a no brainer here, but if you want to do our ratings, uh, bring that funky flick back, bring that funky funky flick flick back back. or leave it in the vault. (laughs) Boogie. Yeah. Like I said, it was such a well done biopic. Bring that funky flick back. Yeah. All right. Bring that funky flick back. Yes. Bring that funky flick back. No doubt about it. Hip Hop Movie Club is produced by your HHNCs, JB, Boogie, and Dino Wright. Theme music by Boogie. Check us out on TikTok and Instagram at Hip Hop Movie Club. On the next episode of the Hip Hop Movie Club podcast, your HHMCs will review Crush Groove. It drops in two weeks. Subscribe today in your favorite podcast app and you won't miss it. Shout out to your listeners. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, don't hate, elaborate. Elaborate. Shout out to Brain Freeze Trivia in the Lehigh Valley. Check out the Instagram, brain underscore freeze underscore trivia, double underscore time. That's Brain Freeze Trivia time on Instagram. Wow.